let's detour into the lane of anxiety, of patterns and trauma, uh -huh. and talk about why people self-sabotage. Yes. People don't self-sabotage intentionally. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today, I'm going to screw up my life. Right. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drink myself on the ground. I'm going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to embezzle for my company. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lie to everybody about how I'm actually feeling. I'm going to stop taking my meds. I'm going to kick the dog. Like Nobody does that. What happens is people get triggered. And they react. And yeah. then they fall into old patterns. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, I believe, in relationships in particular, or jobs, where you're like, this time it's going to be different is it's different for the first three to six months when it's novel mm -hmm. and when you're intentional and when everything counts. But then when you gotta face yourself. Then when it becomes <laughs> like part of your life, you get lazy and you yeah. slip into old patterns. Or when the stakes get really high. Let's say you're somebody who had a parent die early or your dad abandoned the family and you're scared to love somebody. And so you fall deeply for somebody. And then what gets triggered is this tremendous fear that they're gonna leave. Yeah. Because that's your lived experience. And if you go back to what you did as a child to cope with that fear that somebody's going to leave, that's the exact pattern that you will repeat as an adult. Mm -hmm. The only way to end this or to try to get your arms around it is to attack it holistically because so much of this happens at the subconscious level and it also it gets triggered first by your nervous system and yeah. you're not even aware of it. Right. And so there's a tool that I uh, talk about in this book called High Five in Your Heart. Your and heart. Your heart, yep. So you, you uh, what you do, and, and, and I started doing this because I was having this incredible uh, response from past trauma mm -hmm. happen when the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit, uh, I started waking up feeling like something was terribly wrong. And I would, it would start my ankles and it would flood up my legs and go all the way up my body and I would feel this wave come up. My immediate thought is something's wrong. Mm. And my heart would start to race and I'd feel this full on like anxiety response. And I know what that is now. So I now know that the anxiety response of waking up, which so many people do, this is really actually very, very common. People wake up anxious. Yes, feeling like they're in trouble, or something's wrong, mm. or something's about to go wrong. Yeah, that's not good. Well, if you grew up in a chaotic household. That's normal. Yep, yeah. if you had a caregiver that gave you the silent treatment, Ooh. or had mental illness, or had a drinking problem, or if there was abuse in your or, house, yeah. yep, you did wake up. Anxious. And, yeah, because your anxiety, by the way, was trying to protect you. It mm -hmm. was putting you in a state of being alert so that you were ready in case something happened. But right. for a ton of us, Lewis, we have lived our whole lives with a dysregulated nervous system. That's what I've come to learn during the pandemic, that I have literally lived since probably the fourth grade with my nervous system never truly resetting back to a calm resting state. Mm. And so I started to wake up every morning in the pandemic, like so many people did, but, and I've always kind of had this sort of wake up and feeling like something's wrong. Like, uh-oh, you know, Chris is mad. Like my first thing is like, Chris is already up, he's meditating, he's angry that I've slept 15 minutes longer than it. Like, it's so stupid, you know, this is how we torture ourselves. <laughs> but during the pandemic, it was like a full on anxiety response. And so I started doing this thing where I would put my hands on my heart, like mm. right in the center of my chest. I got yep. big mitts just like you, so yes. you can kind of hit the whole thing. Take a deep breath, and then I would say, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. Mm -hmm. If you can say those things, in this moment it's true. You are okay, mm -hmm. you are safe, and you are loved, whether you're waking up in a mansion or a homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And what would happen as I was doing this, high-fiving my heart, is you're pressing on the vagus nerve. Like that's what you're actually toning. That's the same thing that uh, Wim Hof is teaching with the ice bath. You're mm -hmm. toning your vagus nerve. And what the vagus nerve is, as you very well know, because you talk about it on the show, is it's the switch between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. fight or flight versus rest. So if you ever find yourself in a stressful state, put your, give your heart a high five 
Put your hands on your heart. Go, I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. Repeat it 111 times if you need to. What you'll yeah. feel is you'll feel your nervous system start to settle. You'll feel yourself come back into your body. You'll feel your mind slow down. And you will literally take control of your nervous system. It is unbelievable. And it's also really important because, you know, I, in, in researching this book, I talked to, um, you know, the acclaimed Dr. Judy Willis, who's an a incredible uh, neuroscientist. And she explained something that I never knew, but it makes a lot of sense. If your nervous system is on edge, it's in a, like, alert state, you're dysregulated, it's impossible for your cognitive function of your brain to work. Mm. I can give you an example. If somebody were to bust in here with a gun and try to rob us, yeah, would you be able to do a math problem? No. No. I'd be like, just thinking safety. Yes, yeah. exactly. Save my life. I can't, I, I bet the majority of people actually walk around with a nervous system Ooh. that is on edge like that, particularly post pandemic. Yeah. And for me, the reason why I've actually linked it all the way back. So when I was in the fourth grade, I was molested while I was sleeping by an older kid. Wow. And in the um, kind of array of things that can happen in terms of sexual abuse, mine was very tame. Yeah. Like it was a one time incident. It was mm. a kid who was slightly older than me. It was confusing, not scary. I just possum, disassociated, don't even remember how it ended. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I didn't even remember it. And then I remembered it when I was 28 years old. And I believe that the reason why I have always woken up mm. in a state on edge is because of that incident. Since the fourth grade. Yes. Wow. And the thing is, Lewis, is that I, you know, the morning's a trigger. If you have that stored in your body, something happened to you, something happened to you, something's wrong, something's wrong, because something was wrong, and you don't have the tools, and no kid does, to smooth out your nervous system and heal the trauma, that trauma lives in your body. Yes. And so I believe most self-sabotaging behavior that people continue to repeat is nothing but stored trauma, and your best ability to cope with it when it was happening. That's and why we sabotage. Yes. So I don't think it's intentional. I really don't. Like even a, a, a somebody who's diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, they don't know that they have that. Right. Like they're not intent. Like there's not. It's like such a program behavior. There's no. I'm gonna go do that. I'm. I'm in love with this person. Let's go screw it up. Right. That's not what happens. And this is also why I'm telling you. I, I, I know I'm crazy passionate about this topic of this standing in front of the mirror and changing how you see yourself. If you don't get a hold of that story, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I screw everything up, I'm a bad person, I'm not good enough, nothing works out for me. If you don't change that and start cheering yourself forward, mm -hmm. you will stay locked in these self-sabotaging self patterns because you will act in a way that you believe it subconsciously or unconsciously. I know, it's heavy right. Oh, sorry, keep sorry. It's all good, yeah. I think about your brain as being in two modes. Two modes to your brain that you need to know about. There's autopilot, we've all experienced that. You know, you drive to work and get there and you're like, oh, who drove the car? Oh my God, like I don't even remember driving the car here. <laughs> yeah. Well, you did, Lewis, you drove the car. But the thing is, is that you were in the mode of your brain that's called autopilot. Well, what is autopilot? Autopilot is the interior part of your brain. You'll hear neuroscientists and psychologists talk about the basal ganglia. Very important thing to understand is that there's a part of your brain that its entire job is basically to execute your habits. Habits, big fancy word, means something very simple. Behaviors that you repeat without even thinking about it. When you pull your pants on in the morning, I guarantee you, you either put your left or your right leg in first. And you have to stop and think about which one it is, don't you? Mm. Mm. But not when you're putting your pants on. Right, exactly. Because that behavior is what researchers call a habit loop. Mm -hmm. It gets enclosed, as, it gets encoded as a closed loop system mm. right here. Now, the problem for most of us is that half of the day, we're on autopilot. And that's not me making a guess. That's what researchers that study habits and study psychology say that half of your day, you're basically kind of checked out and you're on autopilot. And when you're checked out and you're on autopilot, any behavior pattern that you repeat can take over. 
And guess what are behavior patterns that we repeat? Thinking patterns. So self-doubt, worry, procrastination, overthinking, analysis paralysis, fear. Those are all thinking patterns that are habits. One of the most important things that I want people to understand is that you're actually not a worrier. You have a habit of worrying. Mm. Big difference. Mm -hmm. You're not a procrastinator. You have a habit of procrastinating. Big difference. And when you understand that any behavior pattern, whether it is a thinking pattern, like you doubt yourself all the time, um, or you get trapped upstairs noodling everything and you can never get started, or whether it's a behavior pattern like you drink too much, or you snap at your kids, or you micromanage your team. Every one of those behavior patterns and thinking patterns can actually be interrupted and replaced using science. Now, let's talk about the second part of the brain. Hmm. Drive. That's this puppy right here. This is what you want. This is your prefrontal cortex. Drive is the mode where you're in charge of your thoughts, okay? It's where you are fully awake, you are present, and you are driving your thoughts and actions. When you're doing that, your prefrontal cortex is active. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that you need in order to learn new behavior, in order to do something difficult, in order to do something uncertain, in order to do strategic thinking. So I'm going to give you an example. So I'm a righty. If I were to try to write with my left hand, mm -hmm. you know, like you know, Lewis is going to sure. torture me and tie my hand behind my back sure. and make me like do this, I could do it. It would look like I was writing with my foot. <laughs> and if Lewis came up to me and said, hey, Mel, you want some bulletproof coffee? I'd be like, Lewis, I'm, tr I'm trying to concentrate. I can't do this. My prefrontal cortex would be el fuego mm -hmm. because it is firing on all cylinders to communicate to my hand new behavior. So the thing that's cool about that is that you can use a simple trick the moment you feel yourself hesitate, the moment you've got one of those moments where you know that you need to, this is that moment that Lewis talks to you about where you got to step outside of your comfort zone and you've got to lean into your passion and you've got to really take some risks and you got to feel the fear and you got to do it anyway. That's the moment where you just woke up and now you got a decision to make. Are you going to drift back into the habits or are you going to awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward and focus and do something new? And so the work that I've been doing and speaking about is all mm. about the five second rule, which is a, a, a trick that I invented by mistake that helps you manually switch, no joke, your brain. It turns off and interrupts the part of the brain that is where all your habits and your behavior patterns are encoded. And it awakens your prefrontal cortex, which in five seconds flat allows your brain to help you change. Mm. And so anyway... I love it. I was rambling on and on because you, you went on this thing about how your patterns can be destructive yes. and nobody teaches us. And that's absolutely mm -hmm. right. And what I want everybody to get out of this conversation between us mm -hmm. is that you cannot control how you feel. You cannot control what triggers you and the fact that you may rise up with anger. You may rise up with self-doubt. You may have anxiety, fill your body, but you can always control what you think and how you behave. And we spend way too much time trying to focus on manipulating how we feel about things and not enough time practicing the skills of controlling your behavior and your thoughts. Because mm. if you can control your behavior and your thoughts, then the way you feel would be different. 100%. And a lot of us are sitting around waiting to feel ready, waiting to feel courageous, waiting to feel confident, waiting for the right time. And that's not ever coming, ever Ever. You're not going to change your life up here. You only change it through action. Mm. And, and so to me, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I did this, this, you know, interview with you with your friend Tom and we talked about how motivation is garbage and this somebody memed it and went crazy. And so mm -hmm. the point that I was trying to make is this, is that, yeah, motivation is great if you feel like, if you feel motivated, but it's garbage and it's, 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 it's a losing bet to wait to feel ready. Mm-hmm. Because it's your body's not designed that way and neither is your brain. And so I want everybody to understand that, first of all, 
you can't control the things that trigger you and the fact that you're going to feel afraid and you're going to feel doubt and you're going to feel uncertain. But you can always interrupt that feeling and take control in the moment yeah. and actually shift what you're thinking and shift how you behave. Yeah. And, you know, the bigger the dream, the more fear you're going to have. You know, even totally. if you feel like you've conquered the fear of something, in order to grow, you've got to take on some new challenge. And there's going to be uncertainty there's going to be some stress or there's going to be some worry or there's going to be some ego checking and there's going to be some identity crisis yeah so there's always going to be this fear that could arise always always i mean did you do you feel like once you've mastered this that you have no more fear me yeah no the fear still comes but i have 100 percent control of what i think and do right. so one of the things that that is important for for me to um to to put on the table is that a lot of times um you know, people look at your, where you are now. And so they'll see me on television or they'll see that Ted talk, or maybe you'll be in an audience of 20,000 people in, in the American Airlines Center. And I'm on stage. And you're like, wow, that chick must've just been more incompetent. I hate her. <laughs> the fact is, uh, that's not at all how I, how I was. I, I, when, when I was 19, I started having crazy panic attacks mm. And they got so bad that I took medication and medication was a godsend for me. I took Zoloft for two decades. When I had our first daughter, who is now 17 years old, the postpartum depression was so bad that um, they put me on Ativan, which turns you into a zombie. And I could not be left alone with her. So mm. when it comes to <clears throat> wow. self-doubt and to how we can torture ourselves with our thoughts, boy, have I lived that nightmare. And as I started to use the five second rule, which we're going to get into, um, and everything about my life changed because when people first learn the rule, what you're going to learn, what you're going to start doing is you're going to start using the rule to push yourself to do things that are annoying. You're going to push yourself to get up on time. You're going to push yourself to work on your business plan. You're going to push yourself to make calls that are scary. You're going to mm. push yourself to get to the gym. You're going to push yourself to speak up more at work. You're going to push yourself to put the booze down. Behavioral, behavioral, behavioral. And then you're going to start to actually use it to change the thinking patterns that are self-sabotaging. Mm. So mm. I, four years ago, wondered as I started to see myself go from fan facing bankruptcy to building a yeah. figure biggest. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I, what, what, what happened for me is I started to say, okay, this is a really <clears throat> cool little trick to bring out the most powerful side of you, but can I use this to actually cure myself of anxiety? And the answer is yes, you can. And four years ago, I went off Zoloft and I started using the five second rule, which I'm going to explain in one second, to um, interrupt the patterns of worry and self-doubt, which, by the way, anxiety is nothing more than the habit of worrying spiraling out of control mm -hmm. and body feelings triggering now the habit of obsessive worrying that turns into anxiety and then kind of escalates to panic. Um, I started using the five second rule to interrupt my thoughts every time I would feel that kind of worry kick in. And because the prefrontal cortex is awakened when you use it, your mind is now ready to take on a totally different thought. It's a very different strategy than just trying to switch the channel on what you're thinking yeah. because you're actually inserting the step that nobody talks about, which is switching the gears in your mind so that your mind can actually take and believe the thinking. You have this incredible family motto that you, I would love for every family to adopt this, but can you share it with us? Um, so in our family, we have a mantra, which is to never worry alone. And that's true of us as parents and also of our kids. And what I, what I hope to instill in my kids with that mantra is the idea that we are worthy of support. We are worthy of being held and nurtured and, um, and supported when we are having setbacks. We are not our setbacks. Our worth is our worth. And when we worry with others, we feel validated. We hear our worth. We see it in the support that others give us. We get that social proof that we are valued no matter what. Hmm. Whatever you do, don't, don't worry alone. That's when we get into trouble. So reach out for support. We think as parents, our job is to raise self-reliant, independent adults. And that is an important thing to do. But there is a more profound lesson that our kids need to learn if we want to raise them to be healthy, and that is the skills of interdependence, how to rely on others and how to have others rely on them in healthy ways. And so that's where the don't worry alone comes from, is part of the skills that I'm trying to teach my kids 
of interdependence. Oh, wow. That's so important. You're right. And we do focus on kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and being self being self-reliant and taking responsibility that modeling healthy connection and interdependence, getting support when you need support, talking about your feelings, that we got to model that too. And if you're not, you're teaching somebody to suffer in silence the way that so many of us have for generations. One other thing that I love that you wrote about was uh, this idea that being good enough is way better than being perfect. Why is that? Yes. So I talk about this in the book that um, when my oldest was born almost 18 years ago, I thought about going back to graduate school to get a PhD in psychology so that I could be the perfect parent with the latest research. <laughs> and I know, crazy, right? Yes. And what I found is that perfection as a parent does not serve me and it does not serve my kids. What serves us both better is this idea of being good enough. And the good enough mother is responsive to her kids' needs. She doesn't meet every need because she can't. Only, you know, no one can. But to be responsive, to acknowledge it, to validate the need, and to do the best that you can do. And that takes us off the hook as parents, not needing to be perfect. And it helps our kids, you know, regulate their emotions when they get a little bit disappointed and frustrated that they can't have the perfect parent in this situation. It reminds me of this thing that you wrote that the difference between getting a 91% on a test and a 99 is having a good life. <laughs> that is it. That, that is it. And, it, you know, as parents, I, I certainly fell into this trap myself. The idea that we had to put our needs behind our kids at every turn. And I certainly subscribe to that idea of needing to be the perfect mother. And then I realized that I was getting burnt out. And I would say the thing that really changed my mind about all of this is the research. The number one intervention for any child in distress is to make sure the primary caregiver, most often the mother or the father, that their well being, their mental health is intact because a child's resilience rests fundamentally on their caregiver's resilience. And caregiver's resilience rest fundamentally on the depth and support of their relationships. I want to make sure everybody heard that. You're saying that based on the research, if there is a child that is struggling, the most important intervention that works to help the struggling child is to give the caregiver of that child deeper levels of support. Yes. If you're somebody that's listening to us right now and you're like, Jenny Mel, that sounds great, but I don't have anybody or I don't even know where to start or who the hell am I going to ask because everyone that I know is also burnt out. You have a framework for this. So can you lay it out for everybody listening? Sure. So this is a, a study that was originally started by Sonia Luthar, one of the leading researchers in the world on resilience. And she did a series of studies, including people who were busy mothers and also had a busy professional life. And she wanted to find out if one hour a week for three months, one hour a week with a small group of four to five people in the same sort of kind of world, if they could be sources of support for each other. And what she found was no mother bowed out, even when the busyness you know, of their, of their professional and, and home lives were calling for them. One hour of the week, they met, they talked about their struggles. And at the end of it, she measured their cortisol levels. Those had lowered. She me measured well-being, relationships with their kids and relationships with their parents. And what she found was that you only need one hour of deliberate support a week, one hour. And for those of you going, but I don't know where to get it. Uh, churches have free daycare. And they have a lot of support groups. That would be a great place to start. Community centers, looking in your town's Facebook pages for events that are going on. You're not going to find it sitting on your couch complaining to yourself about it. You're going to have to put yourself out there. You also say it's critical that we tell our kids and our colleagues and our friends our failure stories. What does that mean? So 
my daughter was in seventh grade and she considered herself a good writer and her seventh grade teacher, you know, gave her her paperback and it had red marks all over the place. So she was so discouraged. And I said, Caroline, come to my computer. And I pulled up an early article I had written for the Washington Post science section. And it was edited by a really seasoned, wonderful editor. And it was a bloodbath. I mean, there were comments. There was, I don't understand this. Can you add more here? I need another interview. Where is this study? Where? And my daughter was like, oh my God, I can't believe they let you write for them. And I've been writing for them for 10 years now. And uh -huh. I said, see, at first I was embarrassed. I told her to need all that work to see all those red marks. And then I thought about it a different way. I said, oh, this person is trying to invest in me. They are trying to make me a better writer. So I now, t I welcome feedback is what I said to my daughter. You know, I sometimes even say out loud to myself in my office, well, that's enough for the day. Like <laughs> just that, because I, I, I have a tendency to overwork. And so I have to put the brakes on myself. And I want to model that out loud to my kids. You have a nicer way of saying, I'm always like, well, I just fucked up again. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, mom, dollar in the swear jar. I'm like, I'm going to be paying for your college tuition with the amount I'm swearing around here because I screw up all the freaking time. In this video, I'm going to show you the specific way that you can use the five second rule to stop doubting yourself and worrying so much. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, just think positive or meh, try not to worry. It sounds simple, but it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is because it doesn't work. And actually research shows that when you try to ignore your worries, it can actually make them worse. Look, I understand this topic more than most people because I struggled for decades, not only with worrying and self-doubt, I actually suffered from anxiety and panic attacks for almost 25 years. And in fact, I took Zoloft for two decades to control my anxiety. Using the five second rule, I've not only been able to stop worrying and doubting myself, I've cured myself of anxiety and I've been off meds for more than four years. I'm panic attack free and I almost never ever worrying about anything. And you can teach yourself to do the exact same thing using the rule. First, here's what I want you to know. You're not a worrier. A lot of us call ourselves a worrier, right? Oh, I'm a worrier. You're not a worrier. You have a habit of worrying. That's a very big difference. You've allowed your mind to drift and linger on negative thoughts so many times. It's now a pattern of behavior that you repeat and you don't even realize it. And that's actually good news because that means that you and I can use the science of habits to break the habit of worrying and the habit of doubting yourself. In the language of habit research, the five second rule is what psychologists call a starting ritual. It's, it's a tool that you can use that will interrupt the negative thought patterns that are encoded in your brain as habits and trigger positive new thought and behavior patterns. The five second rule is shockingly effective because it works with all the latest research about habits. What I've learned using the five second rule is that I do in fact have control over what I think. And when you use the five second rule, you'll discover that you do too. Here's how you're gonna use the rule. The moment, the moment that you feel your thoughts drift, and have you ever noticed how worrying and self-doubt, they have a way of literally like taking you away from a situation. You can feel your mind go from the present moment to drifting to something negative. Maybe you're sitting at a meeting at work and uh, suddenly you start talking down at yourself and doubting yourself. It happens like that. But the moment that you catch yourself do it, that's a moment of tremendous power. You have a decision to make. You can either sit there and listen to the worry and listen to the self-doubt and let it hijack you, or you can make a decision to assert control. That's when you use the rule. You're gonna use the countdown trick, five, four, three, two, one. It's essential. Counting backwards interrupts the negative thought pattern. It's also going to awaken your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that you need to override a bad habit and replace your bad habit with a positive new one. So every time you feel your thoughts drift to something negative, or you find yourself worrying about things you can't control, five, four, three, two, one, it'll switch the gears in your brain, it'll interrupt the negative thought pattern, it'll activate your prefrontal cortex, 
and you've just created a starting ritual that will prime your mind to accept a more positive thought. That is how you use the rule to change. Some days you might use the rule 20 times to interrupt your habit of worrying and doubting yourself. I was just confessing to you that I did a whole worry spiral this morning and I'm teaching you one of my favorite tools, the six sentence word, what if it all works out? We need to know that it is painful to stand there and be terrified that you're going to uh, not be able to say goodbye to somebody that you love because you're scared of flying and now you're sitting in an airplane seat. And when you say to yourself, what if it all works out? You know what it's like? It's like, okay, life just fired an arrow at you. And I want you to stop and think right now, okay? What is an arrow that life fired at you? And think about something going on in your life right now. And in order to get you thinking about this, I'm going to bring in our global audience because I knew I wanted to talk about this. So we put up something on Instagram real quick and you guys respond like, oh my gosh, moths to a flame. It's incredible. I love you. And I asked, what would your life be like if you didn't worry about anything? And what are you worrying about right now? And so let me tell you some of the arrows that life is throwing at people. Um, I'm scared of flying. This is Sylvia. And um, I always worry because I feel out of control that I'm going to die on the plane flight. And here's the second arrow. You ready? That she's firing. What if I can't say goodbye? What if this is it? That's the second arrow. It's fine to be afraid of flying, but why are you torturing yourself with all these horrible thoughts? Instead, I want you to reach up and grab that second arrow that you're aiming at yourself with your worries in midair. I want you to yank it out of the air by going, what if it all works out? What if this plane lands? What if I not only get to see all these people that I love and say goodbye, but I'm the last one standing in my family. I outlive them all. What if it all works out? Here's another one. Maggie, annual reviews are coming up. Mm -hmm. Boom, that's an arrow in the heart. That's the first arrow. It is nerve-wracking. That's true. But why does Maggie need to go, what if I get fired? What if I'm the one that gets laid off? What's going to happen to my kids? How am I going to pay for groceries? That is the second arrow. That's why you need, what if it all works out? You reach up, you grab it, you grab it, you grab it, you grab it. Here's another one. Here's a really, really important one from Gabby. I'm going through a divorce. Boom, arrow straight to the heart. Even when you know it's the best thing, it's still painful, isn't it? That's what happens in your life. But the second arrow, what if I never, ever have the life that I actually want? You got to stop that shit from hitting your head. You got to stop firing that stuff right at yourself. That's why you got to reach up with these six words. What if it all works out? What if it all works out? What if getting divorced is painful, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me? What if this divorce is really challenging right now, but I'm going to emerge stronger and a better version of myself and my kids are going to be better and that's going to open the door to me being in a healthier, more supportive relationship? What if this is the best thing that ever happened to me, even though it's the hardest thing that ever happened to me? Isn't that awesome? This is how you stop firing that second arrow at yourself. Here's another one. There are natural disasters in the news all the time in the area that I live in. That's an arrow every time you see a natural disaster. But why do you have to fire the second one at yourself? What if the mudslide takes out my house? What if the volcano erupts here? What if the floods come and they wipe out that thing? It hasn't happened yet. So why on earth are you causing yourself this pain? I'll tell you why. Because we're used to doing it. This is what we do reflexively. Life fires an arrow and then we fire the second one. And so this is why what if it all works out isn't just putting lipstick on a pig or icing a shitty situation over with some like positive gloss. This is actually using science to combat your shitty habits of torturing yourself. This is you intervening with logic because if something bad hasn't happened how does worrying about it help you right now if you don't know what's actually going to happen how does worrying about it or assuming the worst case going to make things better it's not in fact you experience the pain twice because you experience the anticipation of it and let's just say you are going to get fired and look I've been fired twice 
I have been literally brought into somebody's office and told I'm doing a terrible job and let go. It is the worst. And then the second you leave, once you get over the humiliation of the whole thing, it's the most liberating thing that ever happens to you because you typically only get fired from a job that you can't stand anyway or that you know that you're not performing in, which is the case. But I knew it was coming. I just could feel it. I tortured myself for a month. I didn't need to do that because it didn't change the outcome. If anything, it made me experience it over and over and over. And I'll tell you, anticipating it, way worse than what actually happened. If I had just said to myself for those 30 days, what if it all works out, Mel? What if you do get fired and it's the best thing that ever happened? What if uh, you're not going to get fired, but this is a wake-up call for you to step it up and actually start performing a little bit better? It allows you to stop experiencing so much pain. Actually, yesterday, I, I, I did this before I flew to Salt Lake because I was racing around the house. I couldn't find my freaking computer charger. I couldn't find my passport. I couldn't find the bag that I normally put my travel equipment in. And I was racing around. I was freaking out. I was like, oh, my God, I, I only have 15 minutes before I got to go. What if I don't find that? And I was like, Mel, stop. What if it all works out? What if you suddenly find the charger? Or better yet, you're an adult. You can get to an airport and buy a charger. So instead of literally firing arrows at yourself, you could stop firing it and focus. And that's why this is super, super important. I'm going to talk about the other reason why it's critical that you not escalate situations with this unnecessary worrying. Okay. Here, let me give you some other ones from our audience. Um, oh, Natalie. Anytime I see somebody else happy, boom, arrow to the heart. That's what's happening around you. Then she fires a second one. What if I'm never going to find my person? Does worrying about that help you find your person? No. It actually makes you feel more insecure. And this is where I want to go next because here's the thing. There is a profound connection between catastrophizing and aiming these arrows at yourself and the pain that you feel and how it impacts your ability to problem solve, to think clearly. This all comes from research out of UCLA from Dr. Judith Willis. I wrote about this extensively for my research in the High Five Habit book. We interviewed Dr. Judith Willis for that book and dug into her research. And she is pioneering all of this research around the connection between your nervous system and the ability for you to do what's called executive function. Executive function is basically the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex part of your brain, your forehead, basically, for those of us uh, kind of everyday people. It's your ability to problem solve. It's your ability to make strategic decisions. It's your ability to think clearly. When you start aiming that second arrow, my daughters must have fallen off a cliff. I haven't heard from her. Something terrible has happened. I'm going to get fired. I'm never going to be happy again. I'm never going to get this weight off. And the pain and the pain and the pain that comes with doing that to yourself, it sets off the alarm, the fight or flight or freeze part of your nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, it's called. And when the alarm nervous system is going off, it impairs the cognitive functioning in your brain. It impacts decision-making. It impacts your ability to focus. It impacts your ability to problem-solve. And so you're not only firing a second arrow at yourself, which causes so much pain, you are also firing that arrow right into the center of your forehead. And it impacts your ability to think clearly, to solve a problem. And here's why this is important. Let's just say for those of you that are really skeptical and you're like, but yeah, but, but, but Mel, what if something bad does happen? What if, what if your daughter did fall off of a cliff and she's laying there with a broken clavicle and, and she needs help? I'll tell you what, if I don't hear from her in 72 hours, I need to move into problem solving mode, right? Is it going to help me solve a problem halfway around the world if I've shot an arrow into the center of my forehead and I've worked myself into such a state that I can't think clearly? Uh, no. And so even if the worst case scenario that you're terrified about happens, your ability to face it, to problem solve through it, to think clearly about your options, it is severely impaired by this constant worrying that you are doing. And that's why this is so important. What if it all works out? It doesn't guarantee that it will. It guarantees that you will stay calm, 
that you will stay focused, that you will stay present, and that you will stay positive until you know otherwise. And that's everything. All right, I'm going to hit the pause real quick. I got to run to the bathroom because I have a feeling that I'm going to be talking to you right up until the time I got to race out of this hotel room to go give a speech. Don't go anywhere. I got more that I want to share with you, including a lot of really cool research. Stay with me. Welcome back. It's your pal Mel. And we're talking about the six words that I use that magically just boom, silences the worry spiral and my anxiety. What if it all works out? Okay. And another thing I'm going to confess to you is that until I stumbled on this, what if it all works out? I didn't realize how much I was doing this to myself. I basically walked around life with a second arrow in my head because I was constantly worried about something, constantly thinking something bad was going to happen. And, you know, some of the experts that we've had on this podcast that talk about trauma or talk about the impact of growing up in a chaotic household or experiencing abuse or being the kind of person that felt like as a kid, you were always waiting for the other shoe to drop. You were super hyper vigilant. This is very, very common for people like us. That is me. Miss looking around the corners, what, 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 what is the bad thing that's going to happen, anticipating things. And what I'm here to tell you is that if you start to really lean into what I'm talking about, which is how you aim the second arrow at your forehead and you start utilizing, well, what if it all works out to grab the second arrow, yank it out of your forehead and be present in the moment and not escalate things until necessary. You can still tap into your intuition. You can still look around corners, which is a superpower for you. But you don't have to add on the pain that all of the negative thoughts are creating. And there's so much research about this. First of all, stress can actually lead to physical pain. It comes from Dr. Arthur Barsky, who's a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, where they've done these studies uh, about how stress can lead to physical pain. And let me tell you something. When you start allowing yourself to worry, I'm not going to get into college. Uh, I'm not going to be finding love uh, after my spouse has died, or I'm never going to get this weight off, or I'm not going to get control of this. When you start doing that to yourself, it does cause physical pain. And you know this. How many times have you been so stressed out or worried that you get a headache? Or you've been worried before a test and you get nauseous, don't you? Or you start shaking or your stomach is twisting in knots. That's why we say twisting in knots because that's what it feels like. It's physical pain. And a lot of times it begins from your nervous system getting triggered. That's the first arrow. And the second arrow is your thoughts. So they've done all of this interesting research. And what they have been able to prove in studies is that the neural pathways in your brain that indicate physical pain. The same ones light up when you have a painful thought. And it is painful to think that you're never going to be happy. It is painful to think you're not going to see your loved ones again. It is painful to think that you're never going to achieve your dreams or that you're never going to amount to something. That's why I want you to stop it. Scientists have also done this really interesting study where they looked at math anxiety. So math anxiety is literally just feeling stressed out and worried when you're about to do math problems. And the anticipation of doing math prompts a similar brain reaction as when you experience pain. And the researcher, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and the leading expert on math anxiety, said that it is the equivalent of burning one's hand on a hot stove. And I love knowing this research because it allows you to stop and go, huh, it is true. Because it is painful. It's painful to think these thoughts. And that's why I want you to really steal these six words from me. What if it all works out? I also want you to steal this Buddhist teaching and proverb that when misfortune or stress or something doesn't meet your expectations or something painful happens in your life, that is the first arrow. Hits you right in the heart. But the second arrow is the one that you fire back at yourself into the center of your forehead based on what you think about what just happened. And that's the piece that you have control over. Yes, you will always think negative thoughts, but you don't have to escalate it. You don't have to stay there. And you can use these six words, what if it all works out, and logic to pause that spiral and to question you're thinking. And when you question yourself, well, what if it all works out? 
The fact is, it just might, right? Like, you don't know. You haven't even entertained that possibility because you've been so busy firing arrows at your forehead, you didn't even stop to think, well, there's a whole different possibility here. And based on the research of Penn State, 91% of the time, that's the possibility. So what the hell am I all worked up about? Because getting worked up, as we know, based on the research at UCLA and from Dr. Judith Willis, it doesn't help me. And here's the final piece. I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to face the things that are painful in your life. And I also believe in your ability to problem solve and to rise to these moments where life is painful and life is challenging. And if something bad is going to happen, I want you to not face it with an arrow in your head. I want you to have your full capacity to think clearly, to ask for help, to solve whatever issue is happening in your life. And that's why this is also important. It's because between now and whenever something amazing or something terrible happens in your life, you have the ability to be more present and to assume good intent and assume a positive outcome. And that is going to help you both enjoy your life, but it's also going to help you face things if they do in fact turn out to be hard, which we know based on the research is about 6% of the time. Those are odds I'm willing to play with. I'm willing to play with those odds. I'm willing to bet that things are okay. I'm willing to bet on you and me and our ability to be more positive, to be more optimistic, to be more trusting, and to live in that space until we know otherwise. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? I think it does too. When you train yourself to reach up and grab that second arrow before it hits your forehead, because you don't know. You don't know. So you might as well coach yourself to think something positive will happen. You might as well learn how to default to positive ideation, where you say, this could be the best thing that ever happens to me. This isn't easy, but I trust that I'm going to grow through it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think I can figure it out. This is more difficult than I thought it would be, but boy, am I proud of myself for doing this. When you can default to positive ideation, I haven't heard from her in two days. She must be having the time of her life. I haven't heard from her in two days, but I saw that sunrise, which means she's probably so busy with all the friends she made up there because she was also taking photos of other people up there. Uh, she must be so busy. She didn't have time to talk to her mother. And wouldn't that be the most amazing thing that could happen if you went on a four-month solo backpacking trip as a 24-year-old woman to be so caught up in the moment that you don't have time to check in at home? Boy, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? And that's what I am telling myself because that's what I believe is true. And research shows that getting your mind to focus on positive thoughts, positive outcomes, visualizing, hey, what would it look like? If this all works out, scientists call this positive ideation. It is so effective in beating down that worry. So I want you to try it because, hey, what if you use these six words and it all works out? That would be a beautiful thing. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that since you're listening to um, this or watching this, you, like me, are a high achiever. You have very high standards for yourself. You're looking to improve your life. Well, I want to flag a very big mistake that took me 52 years to uncover and to change my own life. And it is the single biggest and most profound change that I have ever discovered. And it is this. At a very young age, I started to realize, and I think, you know, we all have this epiphany where we go, oh, holy cow, when I get good grades, my parents like me and they love me. I get a lot of positive attention when I make the football team. I'm really feeling loved when I make the cheerleading squad. Ooh, when I got into that college or had that major or made that money or bought that nice car, people really gave me a lot of positive attention. And we high achievers, make a mistake 
of fusing what we're doing with our worthiness. We start to believe that we are only worthy of celebration, support, and love when we are doing something that is worth celebrating or worth validating or worth cheering for. And if you don't wake up and separate the things that you're doing and striving for and the goals that you have from your inherent self-worth as a human being, you will forever feel this sense that you're not enough. You will forever feel this void because if your self-worth and your lovability is anchored in achievement, even when you make a million dollars, even when you make the New York Times bestseller list, even when you meet the person of your dreams, the second you achieve that thing, you're going to now look for something else because your worth as a human being depends on what you're doing. The high five habit is all about this radical idea that will change your life. And the idea is this. If you are breathing, you're worthy of celebration. The mere fact that you exist is why you are worthy of being loved and supported and forgiven. And it's why you deserve kindness. It's not because you made it to the gym. It's not because you're making a hundred grand. It's not because you just got promoted. Should you celebrate those wins? Of course. But those wins are not the reason why you're an extraordinary human being. And, you know, I had this all knotted up and, you know, I wondered why, why, why did I, you know, every time I achieve my goals, I would still see a woman in the mirror that wasn't enough. I was my own worst critic. And by critic, this is what I mean. I was relentless in focusing on what wasn't working. I was relentless in pointing out to myself all the things I did wrong instead of a thousand things I was doing right. And that constant grinding beatdown was so just much the default, I wasn't even aware of it until I discovered the power of high-fiving myself in the mirror and silencing that critic. And, you know, I'll tell you an even more personal thing that I bet a bunch of you are going to really relate to. So when I discovered the high five habit, and it was just by dumb luck, I was going through a lot in my life. It was April of 2020. There was a lot going on in my business. This was before the PPP loans had come out. The speaking business was in a free fall. My television show had been canceled. My kids, our kids had come home and they were just, just exploding with anxiety and grief and anger about college getting canceled. Like it was just like a mess. And I would wake up in the morning and I just felt overwhelmed by my life. And it doesn't even matter what's going on in the backdrop because I think we've all had that experience where you just feel overwhelmed by your to-do list. You feel overwhelmed by how busy your life is. You feel overwhelmed by the issues that you're facing. Even though there's other amazing things going on, it's like the overwhelm that drags you down. And so I'm standing in the bathroom and I look at myself in the mirror and I immediately begin with the beat down. I'm like, oh God, you look terrible. And the lines on my neck and my boobs hanging lower than the other. And you know, I did the circles under my eyes. And then of course, once your mindset goes critical, it rests there. So it went from attacking my physical appearance to why do I wake up so late? God, I got eight minutes to get on a Zoom call. You, you forgot to text Scott back. Oh, come on, Mel. Like boom, 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 boom. No grace, no kindness, no compassion. That's how I started my day. And, and, and in this moment, on a random morning on April 2020, all of a sudden, this is divine intervention. There is no question. I stop for a second and I realize, holy cow, that woman in the mirror looks beaten down and overwhelmed. And for whatever reason, I just raised my hand and I gave her a high five in the mirror. And, you know, look, 
it's not like lightning striked in that moment. But what happened is my shoulders dropped. I laughed because it seemed so stupid. But I felt this like energy shift. It was sort of like a shift like, all right, okay, cut. Sort of like if a teammate blows a free throw in basketball. When you high five them, it's like, shake it off. Come on, we're going to still win. Get out there. I believe in you. Let's go. It's that kind of mm, energy. And so I felt that. And I kind of had this like, come on, you got a roof over here. You're going to be fine. You're going to figure it out. I know you, I know it's a lot, but you're going to figure it out. Mom. And boom, I went on with my day. And the next day I did it again. And the next day I did it again. And the next day I did it again. And I started to realize I was feeling something. First of all, the critic was shutting up because the years where the science gets crazy cool. And this isn't just Mel Robbins science. The woman who discovered neuroplasticity 30 years ago, that neuroscientist went bananas. Her head basically exploded when I started discussing the high five habit. Here's what we know happens when you add a simple high five to your morning routine. Number one, you get a drip of dopamine and dopamine is critical. The reason why dopamine is critical is because it boosts your mood. When you simply high five yourself, your brain recognizes the high five because the programming's already in here. Your brain knows what to do when the high five is coming. Boop, dopamine. Dopamine's important because it boosts your mood. We know that your mood in the morning impacts productivity all day long. Second thing that it does, as you go to raise your hand, the first time you do it, you're gonna be thinking, Mel, Scott, you, you two have lost me on this. This is so stupid. Like your critic is gonna be going because this part of your brain is gonna be engaged. The second you get close to me or something crazy happens, your mind goes silent. Your mind goes silent because your brain is now triggered by the action. This is called neurobics, an entire field of study about neuropathway activity and physical motion. Your brain goes quiet because your brain recognizes a high five. And so it grabs all the neuro association and programming in your subconscious and it marries it with your reflection. A high five has always said, I believe in you. I see you. I love you. You got this. It is celebration. It is belief. It is confidence. It is optimism. It is resilience. It's motivation. A high five, never in the history of high fives has a high five been, have a terrible day. You are the worst. You're going to fail. That's not what a high five means. That's why your critic shuts up because the high five programming that's already in your brain overrides it. It's incredible. That's the third thing that happens. As you repeat this new action your brain is watching, this isn't a mantra, which doesn't work by the way. This is a physical habit your brain is witnessing you do. So your brain starts to see you treating yourself with kindness, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, support. Your brain's filter, the reticular activity set, system is paying attention. It's changing in real time. Do you realize that after adding a simple high five to my morning routine, it took about five days for this to happen, by the way, but I've now done it since April of 2020. Every single morning after I brush my teeth, I stack the habit together. It's now programmed as a habit loop in there. Don't even think about it. The benefits are incredible. When I see myself in the mirror, it wouldn't occur to me to think something negative because I have fundamentally rewired my mind. I see a human being that I'm rooting for. I see the person I high five every morning. It's freaking unbelievable. And the way that it's changed me as a leader, I don't look at what's wrong. I focus on what's working. Like it's unbelievable to have a default that you have intentionally programmed in that's optimistic, encouraging, supportive. It's life-changing. So let's talk about loving you, you, the you of you, and how that yeah. is such a diversion from what you've been practicing doing yourself. Oh, that's so true. Oh my God. You know, it's so funny because here I invent this thing called the five second rule out of dumb luck, drunk on bourbon. I literally <laughs> share it by mistake on a TEDx stage. And I invented this thing to help me get out of bed during the worst moment of my life and finally face the issues that my husband and I had, had gotten ourselves into. It spreads around the world. 
I use the five second rule to build a business, to be productive, to, you know, do, 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 do. But it wasn't until I discovered the high five habit that I actually understood how deeply I had been betting against myself, Mm -hmm. how every step of the way I had been criticizing myself or focusing on what was going wrong, that when I stood in front of the mirror, Kathy, I did not see a successful woman. I did not see somebody that was, you know, out there making a huge difference. I saw what was wrong with me. I think for the first, for the last 45 years, I have either criticized or ignored the woman I saw staring back with me in the mirror. And so like the high five habit, I'm sorry, I, I, I just kept barging along. Is there something you wanted to? No, I'm just taking it in. You're right where you need to be. Keep going. And so, you know, the high five habit, it did not begin like some big business strategy. I didn't go, okay. I had the five second rule. I need to write a book about the five something. What is it? Like, let's, let's manufacture something. Oh, atomic habits is good. Let's get a habit book. Like that's not what happened. Cause that's not my brand of self-help. My brand of personal development and empowerment is hit rock bottom, have a challenging moment, resist change, and then come up with something that sounds so stupid. And so ridiculous that it couldn't possibly be something that would actually work. And then when it actually starts working, not only for you, but people who follow you, you better fucking figure out how this thing works, Matt. Like, why is this working? And so the the high five habits, no different. I have been trying to write a book, Kathy, for five years. The the five second rule was self-published five years ago. I have dyslexia and ADHD. I can create an audio book like in a day. Yeah. Writing something forget about it. I bet I have written seven books in the last five years. All of them sucked. And what happened for me, this is not a pandemic book, but what happened for me, because we're all sick of hearing about the pandemic. But what happened for me is, you know, when the COVID hit, we all have that moment. Like, I'm sure you remember the moment you knew, oh my God, like this is changing everything. Yeah. What was it for you? When they said two weeks, the kids would be off school. And then they said, no, it's going to be a month. And I had that feeling of like things closing in and the claustrophobia, like how will I be able to exist now with, with us not being able to go out to even a park? What if this would stay this way? Yeah, it was right then. I couldn't believe they were like closing school. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was, uh, it was, it was a Wednesday in March in uh, 2020. And we were taping uh, this talk show. It was my dream to be a daytime talk show host. And at the age of 51, I got the opportunity to do it. And so we had shot 167 shows at the CBS Broadcast Center. And all of a sudden, somebody comes into the studio space and says they found COVID in the building and you need to evacuate. You got to be out of here in five minutes. The fire trucks are outside. Mm -hmm. And like that, show canceled, fired from my dream job didn't get to say goodbye to the 130 people that I had been working with for over a year. That is I so cli- painful. <laughs> but hey, everything is preparing you for something. Everything. And so I get into my car and I'm driving home and I realized as the New York City skyline was dry, was was disappearing and my daughter was in Spain and she called and said, I just heard the news that they're shutting down the borders. I need to get a, like, I, you got to get me out of here. And then I hung up with her and all of a sudden it was my daughter in California. USC is shutting down, mom. What is it? What's happening? What, what's going on? And I thought, oh my God, what is about to happen? And so in a matter of two weeks, my uh, a book contract that I had got canceled and they wanted the money back. My every speech I had booked for more than a year yeah. started canceling. And that was the beginning. The kids come home, they're in a state of turmoil. We all experienced it, right? And I think for those first three weeks, it was like a complete blur. I I basically never got out of my pajamas. I started drinking Bloody Marys at about 11 a.m. We watched Harry Potter marathons and Glee. We watched that season, like all of it. And then all of a sudden, one morning, I woke up and I just felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. Yeah. I woke up and I started feeling a couple things. I felt Am I, do I need to reinvent myself? 
again? Oh my God. And then I thought, am I about to lose all my money again? And I'm like, I'm too old for this shit. I've worked too hard. Like you go into that like mode where like, why is this happening to me? I, I'm a good person. I've worked so hard. Like you like kind of go yeah. at yourself. And so I'm thinking this and I'm like, okay, get up, just get up. Five, four, three, two, one. I get up. I make my bed. I always make my bed. And then I drag myself to the bathroom and I start brushing my teeth. And as I'm brushing my teeth, Kathy, I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And I think, oh my God, you look like hell. And the gray hair is coming in and there's dark circles under my eyes and my neck is all saggy and one boob is hanging lower than the other. And I'm literally, I felt sorry for the woman I saw in the mirror. She looked exhausted. She looked scared. She looked overwhelmed. And as soon as you start to go down a negative path in your mind, it will continue taking you there. And so I immediately drift to everything I'm worried about. I'm worried about my parents. I'm worried about the world. I'm worried about frontline workers. I'm worried about COVID. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my employees. I'm worried about what's going to happen to my business. I'm worried about everything. And the interesting thing in that moment is if you had walked in, I would have been able to pivot on a dime, especially we women. That's what we do. I would yeah. be like, Kathy, Kathy, don't you dare. Don't you dare. I know this isn't fair. I know you don't deserve. If anybody can handle this, Kathy, you can. You're going to pick your ass up. You're going to pull on your big girl panties and you are going to get your <laughs> ass back out there, right? Yeah. You can do that for anybody else. But there I was without a bra on. My attitude in the gutter overwhelmed by my life, stressed out, no energy, last on my list, mm -hmm. an impossible amount of shit to deal with, just defeated. And I couldn't think of a damn thing to say to myself. And you know, the other thing is I probably wouldn't have believed it anyway. Right. But for whatever reason, as cheesy as it sounds, I literally raised my hand and gave the woman I saw in a mirror a high five because she needed it. And, you know, it wasn't like lightning struck, but something shifted in me. You know, I felt my shoulders drop. I felt my chin lift. I laughed because it's so dumb standing there, high-fiving yourself in your underwear. My God. And it's interesting because I also felt like, okay, you know, come on now, Mel. Don't be so dramatic. You can handle this. And I left the bathroom. Now, it was the second morning that something really clicked with me because I woke up again, all the same problems, yeah. all the same overwhelm, five, four, three, two, one. I get out of bed. I make the bed. I drag myself into the bathroom. And right as I was getting to the bathroom, that's when I felt something I've actually never felt before in my entire life. And that is this. You know, when you are about to go see somebody you really like, and you're going to meet him for a cup of coffee or like a, you know, like a glass of wine or whatever. And you're about to enter the cafe. What do you feel, Kathy, as you're about to see somebody you like? You're excited. And there's like this anticipation. And so you're already feeling good vibes because you know what that person's like and being totally. in their energy. Yeah, totally. That's exactly how I felt sitting in your Zoom room. Like, let me in, Kathy. Let's go. Come on. I can't <laughs> wait to see you and meet you. Um, I actually felt that about seeing myself. I have never felt that in my entire life. I have never been excited to see the human being Mel Robbins. I have been excited to see my outfit. I've been excited to see if the eyeshadow looks good. I have never looked forward to seeing myself, the human. And so I walk in and I'm a little bit more present this morning and I'm brushing my teeth and I put my toothbrush down and I take a moment and I really look at myself 
And I don't even see my face. I see a human being. What's coming up for you? I mean, that's just so beautiful. Like what you just said, we think about that when we're about to go see our friend or, you know, the other mom who her daughter's in your daughter's class. And there's like an excitement. Like you feel like this is like a gift to spend time with this person, but you had never thought about that. And I just think about the women and the men who I've, I've met in my life, the people who listen to this show, who they're so good, Mel, and they're so wired to achieve, but they're only as good as like their last achievement. Mm. So there is nothing other than like, well, what's my big post today on Facebook for everyone to see that I earned it. I earned it today, but like inherently like me just being me. No, I've never heard anyone say like, what a gift to get to be in that person's energy, my own energy today with myself to see myself. Yeah. It's, it's everything. And so, you know, I, I sat and I, and I looked at the woman I saw in the mirror and I thought to myself, well, who does she need me to be today? And what game in life matters to her and how could I actually just like move the ball down the field today and so I thought about it and I thought in that moment based on what was going on that who she needed me to be was more optimistic about our ability to get through this and the game that I wanted to play was showing up in a different way for our kids because they were looking at Chris and I about what was happening in the world yeah and so I raised my hand and I like high five my reflection. And so there's a couple things that I just want to explain first about when, you know, you do this because the beauty of this habit, and this is just the first habit in the book, and we're going to talk about it. And trust me, we are going to get down to the achievement stuff <laughs> next because it's, it's, it's really important part of why everybody resists high-fiving themselves and why they feel that it's weird. And I'm going to unpack that in a very methodical way because thematically, when you feel that this is weird or you resist giving yourself this support and celebration, what's contained in the resistance is the key to understanding why you don't have what you want. And it's also the key to unlocking the cage that you're trapped in. First of all, love is an action. So write down on a piece of paper, what would you do to show a human being that you love, that you love them? What you would, would be, I do? Yeah, what I'd would you do? I'd be nice to them. I would yeah. say nice things to them. Yeah. I would bring them coffee. I would give them a kiss. I would do a lot of things. Yeah. You'd compliment them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd, you'd encourage them to take care of themselves. You'd support them in their goals and dreams. Mm -hmm. You'd tell them good job when they do something great. You would reassure them when they fail. You need to do that to yourself. And this isn't just some cheese ball like thing. All of the research shows that being critical of yourself, which most of us are as a default, it is demotivating. And so one of the reasons, you know, I'll give you two hacks. One is get your ass out of bed, five, four, three, two, one, and create a morning routine that really sets you up to feel supported and to feel encouraged and to feel clear about your own priorities. That's what love is. That's number one. Number two, please add to your morning routine the high five habit. Here's how you do it. When you stand in front of the mirror after you brush your teeth, I want you to do this right after you brush your teeth because based on research, if Most you- people brush their teeth. <laughs> yes. And if we um, stack this new habit with something you already do, it's going to encode much faster. Yep. Put your toothbrush down, look in the mirror. Based on our research, Dr. Hyman, 50% of men and women cannot do this part. Mm -hmm. We did a study where we had 164,000 people in 91 countries take what I call the high five challenge. You can just go to high five, number five challenge.com, high five challenge.com to do this. <clears throat> and all you're going to do is practice a high five habit five days in a row. 50% of men and women could not look at themselves in the eye. Why? They don't like the person they see. If you can't look at yourself in the eye, that is a habit of self-rejection that begins mm -hmm. your morning. Mm -hmm. All you're going to do 
after you look yourself in the eyes, which is the hardest part for most people, is raise your hand and high five the human being you see in the mirror. Mm. It sounds <laughs> profoundly stupid, but wait to hear the neuroscience. Yeah. So you have for your entire life, Dr. Hyman, high fived other people. That's right. What is a high five? The action. Celebration. Communicate. Yeah. Celebration. What else is a communicate? Fun. Yeah. Love. Yeah. If you're in a huddle and a teammate fucks up a play and you come back to the huddle and you high five somebody who just screwed something up, what are you saying to them? You love them. They're okay. It didn't matter. Yeah. Get back in there. I believe in you. All of that programming with the physical action of a high five is already in your brain. Mm. When you high five yourself in the mirror, guess what happens to all that programming? That's get rewritten. To you. To your reflection. You've never high-fived a human being, Dr. Hyman, and thought, I hate your ass. You suck. Definitely not. I hope you lose. But that's what we think about ourselves. Yeah. How could you have done that? You're a loser. You're never going to be loved. Like, you screwed up that many times. Hmm. When you go to high-five yourself, you're going to notice a couple interesting things. Number one, the critic in your head shuts up mm -hmm. because the programming is only positive. It won't allow the critic to speak. And in less than five days, a funny thing happens. It completely changes how you view yourself. You see yourself as a teammate that you're going through life with. You see yourself as somebody who deserves to be encouraged mm. and cared for and love. And then there's all this incredible impact, like you get a release of dopamine. It taps into the celebratory energy of your nervous system. Mm. So it boosts your mood, which helps with productivity. It is profound and it is a silent action that you do every morning that taps into programming and chemicals and all this goodness that's already in your mind, body, and spirit. And that's it, free and takes seconds. Yes. And the results are profound. It's yeah. all in the book. It's, and wow, it's wow. It's all use. research driven, right? Oh yeah. The high five habit. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Check it out. You see, Nina did the high five challenge with me and she had a powerful breakthrough. This is what she wrote, everybody. I have been living with body dysmorphia for more than 20 years. After doing the high five habit for just five days, instead of hiding from my face, I'm finding myself grinning at me instead. Kathy said the high five habit is fundamentally changing how she sees herself. You see, we have, she, this is what she writes. We have this pattern of seeing ourselves in the mirror and always looking at all the flaws. I notice my eyebrows are not aligned. My white hair is growing. Ugh. Why do I have a double chin now? My arms look flabby. I see so many things wrong with myself. And in the world where Zoom and video calls and Facebook lives rule, it's not just the mirror that we have to live with. It is seeing ourselves on camera more times than we would want to. For me, Kathy writes, the habit of high-fiving myself in the mirror creates an affirmation, a physical act of celebrating myself. The act alone forces me to look at my face, my body in a different light, a brighter light, a kinder light, a more compassionate and joyful way. I found I cannot high five myself and say bad things in the mirror. You know, that's true. You can't high five yourself and think something or say something bad. It's neurologically impossible because of the programming associated with a high five that's already in your mind. This is why it's so powerful. We're unlocking neural associations that are already in your mind, everybody. You see, you deserve to be celebrated as you are right now. Not when you lose the weight. Not when you make more money. Not when you fall in love or get into graduate school. Because research shows when you learn how to love and accept yourself wherever you are right now, you will be better able to ride the ups and downs of your life. And by the way, accepting where you are right now is not about complacency, everybody. Accepting where you are and being kinder to yourself and treating yourself with a level of respect and self-worth is the secret to self-motivation. When you feel worthy, it's motivating. When you feel respected, it's inspiring. When you feel a sense of worthiness, you will feel worthy of bigger things in your life. 
You cannot not, not, not pound yourself into the ground and believe or feel motivated to change. It doesn't work that way based on the research. It's the opposite. This is why it's so hard. This is why you're struggling, everyone. Because you want these big things in your life and you deserve them. And you have goals and you have dreams and you have desires, but you stand in this present moment and you have all these hopes and dreams and desires for your life and for yourself. But what you do is you just punish yourself mentally. That's why you're not motivated. You have to learn how to be where you are right now, accept where you are and know in your heart, you still deserve to be treated with loving kindness and respect. And when you flip that switch in your brain and your body and in your spirit, you will be more motivated and inspired to walk toward the things that you deeply yearn for in life than you ever have before, because you will feel worthy of those things. It's so cool. You know, when you beat yourself up all day long, you're pounding yourself into the ground and you're more vulnerable to feeling like you are being buried alive when life gets stressful. Everything starts to feel like a beat down. But when you start to look at yourself in the mirror and accept yourself as you are right now and see a person who deserves celebration and support, you're going to tap back into that natural motivation, celebration and resilience that you were born with. Because you weren't always like this. We are on page 53 right here, everybody. This is one of my favorite parts of the book. Page 53 in chapter four, and I'm going to read it to you right now. I'm Mel Robbins, and we're reading from chapter four, page 53 of my instant best-selling book that is changing people's lives. It's called The High Five Habit. Here we go. You ready? Everything I'm about to teach you is already in you. That's the coolest thing about The High Five Habit. We're tapping stuff that's in you. Self-love is your birthright. As a baby, you loved the very sight of yourself. You'd crawl up to a mirror and you wouldn't just high five yourself. You know what you used to do? You used to press your face against your reflection and smile and laugh and love on yourself in one wet, sloppy, open mouth kiss. And there is so much about you to celebrate. Let's start with how unique and special you are. Your DNA sequence, your fingerprints, your voice, the patterns of your iris, every one of these things is entirely unique and yours alone. How you see the world, the way you laugh, the things that you've experienced, the way that you love, it all comes down together to create something magical. You are the only you that will ever exist. Each one of your distinctive gifts and talents is a phenomenon because they are unique to you. And you need to celebrate that shit. And you know what? You are so much stronger than you give yourself credit for. Resilience is hardwired into your DNA. I mean, think about when you learned to crawl as a baby. You didn't try once and give up. You didn't lay on the floor and gaze morosely at the ceiling and say, well, I guess this is my life. It's time to throw in the towel. I'm never going to learn to crawl. I think I'll just sit here on this spot on the rug in my diapers and stare at the ceiling. No, you tried again and again because you didn't have words. So you couldn't tell yourself some sad story about how you just can't do it and you're not good enough or smart enough or strong enough. You know what you did? You kept trying and eventually you pulled yourself across that floor. You're also naturally intelligent. You don't give yourself enough credit for this. By simply watching the people around you as a baby, you figured out how to coo and smile and crawl and scooch and eventually walk. And it didn't matter that you fell an average of 17 times an hour while you were learning to walk. You just kept trying. And that tenacity, that tenacity is still in you. And here's something else, everybody. 
Celebration is part of your DNA too. As a kid, every time you succeeded at something thrilling and new, you'd laugh and screech and raise your arms up above your head. If the music would play, you'd shake your booty and wiggle and jump around. You are perfectly designed to feel loved, resilient, joyous, and celebrated. That's why a stranger's high five feels so damn good. A high five strikes deep down to the core. It hits the you of you. And it reminds you of something you've forgotten, who you really are and how you're meant to feel. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.